Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody is having a good week. I hope that you're off to a great start. Most of you are halfway through. Some of you are like me and we're not quite halfway there. But whatever it is, I hope that you are pursuing something worthy of your energy, your effort, your time, and your life. Uh, Go for the things that provide value. I'm going to leave it at that. Look. I'm going to share something with you. I shared earlier in an early video. It's just a couple of bars from one of my favorite uh, rappers uh, of this of this time. Um, his name is D1. He's out of the out of New Orleans. Uh, he spits a lot of real, true, conscious stuff. It woke stuff. He um, he brings it. He he brings it home. And he I'm gonna let him sort of lead into what. Uh, I want to talk to you about today, which is propaganda, but it, uh, it, the bars simply go, and I'm not D1, but the bars simply go, people don't want that real, they just say they do. People don't want that real, and I'm one of them too. I'm so easily entertained by r- ratchet activity, violent negative imagery always seems to interest me. I tell myself no more music glorifying evil, selling drugs, womanizing, killing our people. Then I hear a song with a tight beat and I can't deny it. The hook is catchy so I subconsciously memorize it. Next thing you know, I'm reciting all the lyrics all, and my day don't feel complete unless I hear it. Inviting darkness in my spirit. This can't be light. I'm craving what I'm supposed to be fighting. This can't be right. I must be blind to the effects. This can't be sight. Death is the power. Death is in the power of the tongue. This can't be life. Be careful what you get involved with because you can't support the cause and then hate the effects that it causes. This is propaganda 101 put to you in 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 sonic form so that you can get it and put it to a beat because we respond to beats which is why music is so influential and powerful i'm going to read from you from a, uh chapter two in the same book i've been going from which is my 19th book out of 26 this is 19 born in captivity psychopathology as a legacy of slavery uh uh-huh. and we've been talking about trauma and everything but i want to talk to you about pro- propaganda and the propaganda uh propaganda slash uh experiential or existential identity crisis and here's here's what it says propaganda as a psychological weapon propaganda as a racist weapon it says due to a lack of understanding as it pertains to psychological welfare the use of media sponsored negative propaganda blacks tend to expose themselves to harmful stim- harmful stimuli that are disguised as entertainment and news we as a race tend to view everything from a superficial perspective and we rarely question motive and intent the use of negative propaganda can be framed from a historical perspective the use of propaganda not only impacts the image and thought processes of the group being targeted but it also provides the contextual framework that dictates how others view the group while we have been in this country propaganda has been used to perpetuate an inferiority complex amongst african americans a, a lack of understanding and awareness of self for those who are aware of the evil machination of the u.s governments and the wealthy elite that control the power the idea of our concept of mind manipulation is not nearly as far-fetched as some postulate when i could when i encounter individuals who are incredulous as it pertains to the power of propaganda to shape the minds and thoughts and actions of a targeted group i usually initially respond with uh common reason i normally will point to the fact that advertisers spend millions of dollars for 30 second ad spots during the super bowl the most watched tv event in the of the year the rationale behind this approach is that common sense should prevail here illuminating that businesses would not spend millions of dollars for a 30 second spot year after year if they were not benefiting benefiting from it and here's a little another little uh sonnet that i actually use uh in my uh concept development of visionetics which is the development of self-image for people who are trying to restructure their lives and become more effective more successful uh that's where visionetics comes from is understanding the power of the human sub uh self-image it says prop uh 
Two men looked out of prison bars. One saw mud, the other saw stars. The one who saw mud will, will be like the spring peach blossom in an early frost nipped in the bud. The one who saw the stars will forever be set free from life's prison bars. And, uh, and I'll finish up with this. My position on propaganda comes from my experience and expertise in behavioral science. Therefore, I will eventually refer to the science behind the use of propaganda in any time referring to it. So whether you're listening to the rap lyrics, whether you're listening to what I just read, here's the bottom line. We as a people are suffering from a massive identity crisis. And that identity crisis is being uh, subsidized by propaganda that influences how we see ourselves, but also influences how we behave. Uh, I hear over and over again, it's just music. I hear over and go, it's just entertainment. Let me tell you something. There's a reason why money took over hip hop and dictates what music is brought to you. It's a reason why if you study the progression of hip hop, it has been dumbed down. We went through the birth stages of it where we were developing it and we were starting to become more sophisticated in our lyrics, in our presentation, in the development of what our rhymes would look like and the content in, uh, what we, what, in which we put in our rhymes, the messages that we delivered in our rhymes was elevating. You, 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 know, you went from uh, one, two, three, one, two, three, da, 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 da to whole flows being spit at unbelievable rates and bars being, t you know, and, and then expanding bars and how, 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 that, how that all took place. And then all of a sudden, you see it dumbed down again. Everybody sounds the same. There's a reason for that. That, that, that familiarity, familiarity of that sound actually breaks down the conscious barriers of what would naturally be a resistance. There are some things you hear and you automatically go, I don't like it. But if your subconscious is used to hearing it, your subconscious will let down its guard. The consciousness is already let down its guard. So what happens? It comes in easy. It's almost like no, basically lulling uh, brain waves to sleep and putting you in a state of theta, which is a download state, which most kids are in up until age five or seven. So what happens is when they uh, dumb down the music, what they did is they made everybody sound alike same cadence, yeah, nah, nah, same thing like that. And the only things you actually hear that you can actually understand clearly are the things you don't need to be hearing. Pay attention to it. That bitch, that Molly and, 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 and so what do you, you get in this constant competition, but what is the big catch? The beat, why? We are naturally rhythmic people. We are, the, the higher you get in the spiritual realm, the, higher, the more spiritual you are as a person, the more connected to the divine source you are, the, the more closer to the original you are, the more rhythmic you are. Check it out. There's a reason why little black kids are almost always born with rhythm. I mean, right out the gate, they come out with the gate. And no matter how, and you can take other people, I'm just gonna say other people, and you can teach them the moves and they can get on beat and you can teach them how to stay on beat and you can teach them how the moves. You can teach them the choreographed steps and everything. But the natural flow of it is never the same as when we do it, no matter how good they get at, get, get at it. And, you know, I'm not going to name no names, but you can think of some of the ones that, that, that got pretty good at it that were performers and just look at their black counterpart. The flow is just so much smoother. It's so much natural. It's because it's a part of who we are. But uh, also, then you have to understand that you're a rhythmic person. You're responding in rhythm. You're responding in rhyme. You're responding in cadence. And that's why it, it, it was such a natural thing for us to flow when we came up with hip hop. But the thing is, we also are uh, subject to the beat. The beat. That's why he sits up and says, you know, uh, I tell myself no more music glorifying evil, selling drugs, womanizing, killing our people. Then I hear a song with a tight beat and I can't deny it. The hook is catchy, so I subconsciously memorize it. Next thing you know, I'm reciting all the lyrics and my day don't feel complete unless I hear it. Addicted to negative music with low vibration that brings your vibration down, takes you. And what happens when it lowers your vibration? 
we have to think of this thing on a number of different levels. One of the things we like to do is we like to compartmentalize. So we talk about psychology, but we won't talk about neurobiology, or we won't talk about neurology, or we won't talk about uh, uh, spiritual energy. We won't talk about all these things, but they're all connected. They are not separate. They make up the totality of who we are. And the more we understand the harmony in which they need to exist and in, in, in the balance that needs to be there and how one being off starts to make the, re the others come off offline and how this all works is so important. So the thing is, it's, you know, when you sit up and you hit that beat, it catches your attention because the beat moves and the beat doesn't have anything to resist in it. It's the beat. And if you're not careful, the beat will make you forget what you're hearing initially until it desensitizes you to it. And the next thing you know, like you said, you spit in the hook. But then once you spit the hook, it's a Dixie. And so the next thing you know, you know the line that comes before the hook and the line that comes after the hook. You see how it connects? And before you know it, you know the whole song. That's how it comes. That's normally how you learn. The hook sets the foundation. So then it's set up that way so that it can feed you. Now, the problem is it's a great thing when it was feeding you love. Uh, my, my, my man Tank talked about this. He talked about the fact that, uh, what's this guy name in, um, uh, in London, uh, God, uh, the, the singer, Smith, last name Smith, I can't think of his name, but he had a song, Stand By Me, Stay With Me, Stay With Me, and Tank was talking about that, he says, he, he, he makes this song, Stay With Me, he goes to the top of the charts, everybody's talking about it, Stay With Me, it's about love, it's about keeping, keeping yourself together, keeping the family together, Stay With Me, the love thing, goes to the top of the charts, everybody's loving it, same person, Tank can make the same song and it gets less airplay, it gets less airtime, why? Because the message isn't the narrative they want to be shown, those love songs we used to hear, we don't hear anymore. We're not getting what Marvin Gaye used to give us. We're not getting what Sam Cooke used to give us. We're not getting what Luther used to give us. Joe and, and, and Tank are the, are, are the leftovers. Now it's all bang, bang, boom. You know, even, even the crooners are, are, are talking about sex. It's not family. It's beating it up. It's not family. It's running through it. It's not family. Why? Because that's the message they want to give. So even the talented kids who have vocals aren't giving you the songs we used to get. We used to get love. We used to get passion. And then, you know, we had the people talking about, you know, you know, uh, cheating, you know, especially in the blues and all that stuff like that. But there was a lot more family love. It was a lot more, make, you know, things that make you want to color. Give. I done made kids to some of the songs back in the day. Now the stuff that's going on now, it, 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 it tests my nerves. It, 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 it really plexes um, uh, my spirit. And, and so what are we getting at? What I'm getting at? I'm getting at the fact that we have to give more prevalence to what's going on. When I talk about these things, I'm talking about it on a superficial level, but I'm talking about it from a very deep understanding. I've spent years understanding the way that this worked. These, these neurons that begin firing when you hear this song, that's this thing called neuroplasticity. It used to be a, a long time ago that... Uh, once you got five or seven years old, they used to say that your personality is hardwired. Who you're going to be is hardwired. What you're going to do is hardwired. You developed your paradigms. You are going to pretty much produce what your self-image is. But now we know through neuroplasticity, nothing is static or fixed. That if I don't like who I am, I can change it. If I don't like the way I think, I can change it. If I don't like my beliefs, I can re-examine them and I can create and uh, present and accept and adopt new beliefs. I can create a better version of myself by constantly what feeding my mind consciously new information that flows through my mind uh, and goes into my subconscious and I'm consciously programming neurologically from a bi neurobiological perspective I'm wiring new neurons in my brains with new information now, here's the thing. The old neurons have been fired for so long. They're stronger and they're bigger. So what I've got to literally willfully over and over again, put new information that contradicts the old information while not giving the old information the same energy, time, and effort, and repetition. The less repetition, the more it atrophies. The more repetition, the more it expands and hypertrophies. 
and grows. These neurons, like muscles, they're firing. I'm, the more I spend, that's why they tell you to repeat affirmations. That's why they tell you to sit up and recite it. That's why they tell you to journal. That's why they tell you to watch the uh, motivation of why. Because literally doing it over and over is wiring a new idea, a new concept, a new mindset, a thing that's going to literally actually what? Change your mood, raise your vibration, and put you in a space that's closer to the divine. Because the higher you move up on the hurt scale, what? The closer to the most high you get. That's the goal. You. That's why I start every day at gratitude. Why? 500 hertz. I'm at least double what all that low stuff is. Anger, envy, strife, jealousy, bitter, uh, all that uh, all that stuff that's at the bottom. 250 and under. So when I get to 500 in the morning, the first thing out of my mouth is thank you. No matter what's going on the day before, no matter what's going on now, it's thank you. Why? Because the moment I say thank you, it immediately tells my subconscious that I'm in a thankful state. My subconscious will naturally and responsively find reasons to sit up and justify that thankfulness. It's amazing how the mind works. But if I tell myself it's going to be a horrible day, my subconscious will automatically go out and find all the reasons why it's going to be a horrible day. Guess what? If I tell myself that uh, I am inferior because they are uh, superior, not openly because we won't openly say it but in trying to be like them in demanding that they accept us in all the ways that they portray us and they put us out there and they give us an image that we're naturally criminal minded if we don't watch out we'll behave that way it's the way the mind let me, let me tell you something that's why you got to be real careful about how you talk to your kids let me tell you something there's something that I often tell parents when I'm doing the conferences, like the ones I shared in the images yesterday in that video. If you didn't watch it, you can see uh, one of the workshops I did on epigenetics and adverse childhood experiences, generational trauma. But one of the things I always tell parents is when you are highly critical of your child, when you are constantly saying negative things to them, when you're constantly tearing them down, telling them how stupid they are, telling them how dumb they are, telling them how ugly they are, telling them how they're going to be like they trifling, sorry ass, uh, dad or mom, telling all these things. They won't grow up to hate you. They will grow up to hate themselves. And it's the same thing that's happening in the propaganda uh, put forth by the media and the experiences that we have in this country. We have gotten to the point where they've constantly told us we're less than them, that we are dumber than them. Uh, you know, in intellectual inferiority is what they say. You know, they are naturally uh, intellectually more superior, but we now know that's different. We now know that we literally give us half a chance and we'll blow up everything. That's how brilliant we are. The, uh, the four highest IQs are from all black kids. That's how gifted we are on the planet kids all having iqs higher than einstein and gates but okay so but what happens is they're constantly feeding us this guess what happens same thing happens with the kid and the parent we don't hate them we hate us because we start to buy into the fact that that's who we the inferiority complexes come in when we are trying to make ourselves look like them, when we're trying to lighten our skin, when we're trying to make our beautiful, unbelievably gorgeous hair look like theirs, when we are trying to do all the things to make us more acceptable than them, how we groom ourselves, the clothes we wear, all these things so that we can be accepted by them. We have bought into this inferiority uh, narrative that literally puts us in a situation where we can't execute the power of our genius. And this is the flow of information. This is one of the things that uh, Tom Burrell worked so hard to tell us in his book, Brainwashed. Uh, having worked in media his entire life running the largest black owned uh, PR firm in the world, he set up and saw the power of media to influence the mind, to influence the self-concept, the self-image. Uh, self so here's what happens when you have a child, you are the primary label givers early in the child's uh uh, developmental stages you are what I call label givers you are the ones who are going to tell this kid who he is and that's why it's important to have what both parents in the house why because there's a feminine message and there is a masculine message there is one coming whether it's the daughter or the son they both need the messages from two parents and they they serve two different purposes the father is the primary source of identity 
That's why uh, historically the family takes on the name of the man because he's a source of identity. In, in more ancient parts of Africa, the man named the child. In some parts, the woman named the child, but, there are t but, but in many uh, in more ancient cultures, the man named the child. He was, because why? The name had meaning. The name is a part of the identity. The name wasn't just something you just, you knew what the name meant. The name was directly in relation to your purpose, what you were gonna do, what you were gonna become. Even if you are not a believer, but you know the story, what happened when God told Abraham that he saw him as a friend and that he was going to make him a father of many nations, that from him uh, many a multitude would uh, descend? What did, he, what did he do? He changed his what? Name. He went from what? Abram to Abraham. And... What does that mean? What, what, what am I trying to get you to understand? The name has a thing. And, and so what happens is they've been giving us our names. And I mean, it happened in during slavery, literally. But it's happened since uh, emancipation, figuratively. But the same is the same. Why is literal and figurative almost the same? Because the way that God designed our mind and our brain to work is that... Uh, in order to be creative, we need to be able to experience things before they happen so that we can convince ourselves that we can do it. And so what happens is God designed the imagination uh, to be as, power, as, as powerful and as potent as the real thing. So the brain, literally, the brain and the mind cannot distinguish between what's being imagined and what's real. <music> That's why they say perception is reality because if I can see it clear enough I can literally tell my mind that I've already done it and what happens with that number one is I'm confident now I've already done it there's no question about whether it's possible or not I've already done it I'll give you a prime example of this in real life 1954 um, track and field the mile that was this thing called the four-minute barrier what is it it was nobody had ever run the mile in under four minutes Many have tried, none had succeeded. And then there was this double down on the fact that everybody believed it was impossible, number one. Number two, the, the people uh, also added to it that if you happen to figure out how to run it, if you get there, you won't live to enjoy it because to run it that much, you would literally get your heart rate up so high that your heart would explode. No medical evidence whatsoever to support it, but that's what was believed. Okay, so guess, you know, the first thing went to mind when I read the story was, I wonder how many people were actually on pace to break the barrier, realized they were on pace to break the barrier, and actually subconsciously slowed down because they didn't want to die. Okay, fast forward, we're at 1954, Roger Bannister steps on the track, becomes the first person to run the mile in under four minutes. And everybody loses their mind. He doesn't die. He doesn't collapse. They bombard him with questions, asking him how he trained, what did he eat, what did he change about his routine, and did he wake up? I mean, just all different type of things you want to know because you, you're the guy that found, you know, solved the enigma, so to speak. And when they sit down and they ask him all that stuff, he said, I simply ran it 1,000 times in my mind. I didn't change anything else. I ran it 1,000 times in my mind. So that day he stepped on that track, it was 1,001. Done this like, I've done this. He got out there and he ran it. It wasn't even, it wasn't even close. He got out there and ran it. That's the power of the mind. I'll give you another example. They took some of the worst basketball free throw shooters in the league. And they did a study with them. They took them and they split them in half. One half was working with the top shooting coaches uh, in the world to, to teach them proper form, proper technique, proper feel, proper release, every all, all the things that should improve free throw shooting. And they were going to work on it six hours a day. This was during the offseason. They were going to work on it six hours a day. 
They took the other group, and for the same duration, they weren't even allowed to touch a basketball. But they worked with some of the best performance psychologists on the planet, and they repeated over and over in their mind, seeing themselves shoot the perfect free throw, go through, hit nothing but net every time. And when it was time for them to stand up and test, they killed the ones who were working with the uh, professionals because, again, you're trying to perfect something and you're trying to work on it versus simply putting it in your mind and perfecting it and then following through on what you've already believe you've done. It's powerful. If you can see it, how many times have you heard me say, if you can see it or conceive it in your mind, that's God, God's evidence that it's possible. If you can conceive it, it's already done. You just haven't executed uh, the final element or component of manifestation yet. Well, the problem is on this end is they're feeding us negative information. They're giving us negative stimuli. They're giving us a false read and we're biting on the false read. You're ugly. You're stupid. You, 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 uh, you're, 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 you're not intelligent. Uh, you're criminal minded. You are animalistic. You are violent. You are hypersexual. All this stuff, and then it's being over and over. And then we're taking the information and we're putting it in heavy rotation. We're not resisting, but we're not pushing back. Uh, one of the things is one of my mentors was actually a Jew. He was Jewish. Matter of fact, my, my first business mentor was a Jew. Uh, taught me a lot of what I know about business, taught me a lot about the ways and things I needed to change about my mindset, but we used to get into these heated discussions um, because he w he was very blunt. He didn't pull his words. Uh, he would tell me, he says, you're going to do some unbelievable things, but you're going to stay frustrated because you're going to want your people to do it, and they simply aren't programmed to do it. And I said, what do you mean? He said, they've been programmed to fail, and just convincing them that they've been programmed is going to be a life work. And I'm like, no. He said, they won't readily go after the information that will set them free. Not in grand numbers. You're going to find some that are immensely uh, exceptional like you. And you are the representation of what's possible. I say you're the representation of what's possible. But possibility is absolutely nothing without follow through. He said the problem is when you can convince a person that what they drive is what makes them important, they chase it. When you can convince them that what's on their feet is what makes them stand out, they chase it. When you convince them that they can ride something that says they're successful, they want to ride it. When they want to wear it, they want to do it. You know, and I look at now, there's, we, we, we'll spend $1,500 on Beyonce tickets and won't buy stock. We'll spend $1,000 on uh, red bottoms. And won't invest in a book. Won't invest in a course. We'll do all of this and we won't invest in the protection and the proper development of our children. We send them off to the schools where these people who are sending them the wrong messages are now responsible for educating them. And we think we're winning. Even when we get them off to school, uh, they're going to a school where they're going to be trained to serve the system. Schools aren't designed to make you wealthy. Think about the things. If you look at my path to generational wealth course, this is an 18-month course. You're going to go and you're going to find that the things in that thing are not in college courses, not even for the ones who are taking finance. The system is trained to put people in jobs to make the elite more wealthy elite. The goal is to have power. In order to have power, you've got to be autonomous, meaning that you can't be, be dependent upon those you may have to execute power against. I can't make my presence felt against you when I need you to eat. I can't make my presence felt against you when I need you to keep a roof over my head. I can't make my presence felt with you when you have the ability to pick up a phone call and change the entire uh, trajectory of my life. And I have no recourse or way to resist it because I haven't positioned myself in the proper vein to make it happen. There's a reason why. Most of the time you see black intellectuals, black scholars, black advocates who want to put their work in books they are going to be with small companies or independent labels or self-published. Why? 
I, that's the reason why I had to start my own publishing company. Now, I've been published by other publishers since, but I had to start my own publishing company to get my first book published. Why? This is what I was told by three established publishing companies. Your book is well-written. Uh, it has a powerful, well-researched message, but the audience is unpredictable. That the investors who put money into our business don't believe that the market is there to sell that book, to recoup what it would take to take this book from concept to uh, print. And that's based off of research. We don't buy books. And when we do buy books, it's normally in the area of fantasy, which actually causes even more problems. So we buy novels. We read about uh, sensual, sexual novels, the knight in shining armor novels, the, the, the guy who pulled himself up, self-made billionaire novels. And then we expect life to be that way. There's no knight in shining armor. There is somebody that will come along and love you. There's no self-made millionaire, but there are some people you can work with and build together. But because we that's we want to be entertained because in, entertainment is escapism. Entertainment takes us away from the responsibility of being who we really need to be in order to do the things we need to do to have what we need to have. And that's what we would rather be. There's no accountability for it associated with it. But this propaganda it's robbing you of your future. It's robbing your kids of their future. It's robbing our culture. It's literally taking us to the dust right now. And we're not working. We're not building. We're not doing anything to stop it. What are you allowing into your gates? More intentionally. More, 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 more even more. Okay, what you're allowing in your gates is important. You should be guarding your gates. You should be very aware of what's coming in and out of your gates. You need to be very aware of what's coming in and out of the gates of your children on a consistent basis. You can't control them all the time. can't watch them all the time. They're going to listen to stuff. Everybody did. We listen to stuff we weren't supposed to when we were kids. They just have more access to it, which means that when you're they're around you, you got to feed them that good stuff. you got to keep giving them that stuff. You're going to have to take time, spend time with them, share with them, put them in programs where they're going to find out about themselves, put them in situations where they're going to learn to trust and depend pen and love themselves but here's the thing more important than what you're guarding what are you intentionally feeding your mind what are you literally choosing to go get so you have the radio and you're riding you get caught up and you'll actually zone the radio out this is what i want you to understand about the power of the subconscious mind the po the, the conscious mind has the ability to process 2,000 bits of information per second the subconscious mind 4 billion bits of information per second Two thousand four billion. It doesn't. Your subconscious doesn't miss anything. So what you may be consciously unaware of, the subconscious is aware of. So you can literally be programmed. As a matter of fact, the easiest time to program you is when you are consciously distracted, and there's negativity in the space. So in other words, I'm riding. I'm in the car. There are certain songs I don't listen to, but I got the radio on, and I'm on the phone. Or I'm daydreaming, or I'm, I'm, my mind is somewhere else, so my conscious isn't focused on the song. And you know you zone things out, you, especially if you got to focus on something else. You'll zone things out. The problem is you consciously zoned it out. The subconscious hears it. If you scan with your eyes, your conscious may miss it, but your subconscious won't. That's why vision boards are so important. Because what you miss with your conscious, your subconscious didn't. So you feed your subconscious even when you're not feeding your conscious. That's the power of vision boards. But what happens is when you're sitting up and you're listening to that song, now the song is playing in the background. It's a song you know you don't want to hear because you don't like the lyrics. You don't like the way it makes you feel. You don't like the message in it. But you're subconsciously feeding it to yourself without even knowing it because that's the power of the subconscious. So what do you you literally need to be that aware of what you're taking in? You need to be. And here's another thing. 
Uh, there's a lot of psychology in the Bible that it wasn't called psychology then. It was just called guarding your hearts and minds. You see it all in the Bible, right? When you start to really study it, it's got uh, psychological uh, principles. One of my favorite ones is in the... Uh, uh, one of one of Paul's letters to the Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter ten, starting at verse three. One of my favorites. It says, "Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh." They know this. They know that the warfare is where. And, and, and what does the scripture say? Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, warfare are not not carnal, but what mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Well, what is it? it says casting down arguments. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Casting out, what is that? Information that's coming to you that's diametrically opposed to who you should be. Diametrically opposed to what you're capable of being. Diametrically opposed to what's possible in your life. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every what? Thought into captivity. What? 72,000 thoughts flow through your subconscious every day. The vast majority of them, you're unaware of them. They repeat and they cycle every day. And you're unaware that they're there. But you're controlling what thoughts go there by what you feed your subconscious. So every now and then those thoughts come to the surface and you get cognitive disruptions, cognitive uh, interpolations. What does that mean? That things, the thoughts that are flowing under the surface come up. You ever had a mood shift and you didn't know where the hell it came from? You were feeling fine. All of a sudden you went to a different direction or you may have been down. All of a sudden you get snatched out. You don't know what brought you out of it. What's flowing underneath. And what you understand is the power of negativity is a lot more heavy than the power of positivity. There's a scientific study that says if you sit up and say something negative you've got to reverse that 17 times with something positive to balance it out the negative things in your life have a much more intensive impact on your mentality your mind and your health so you got to be aware all this stuff you've been bombarded with and you wondering why you're sick wondering why you're having so many autoimmune disorders lupus is on a rampage stress and here's the things i told you about epigenetics so now lupus is on the rampage right so you got stress so that's the development of this autoimmune uh situation but here's the thing now you birth a kid with it why because of epigenetics you literally genetically imprinted a tag above your dna sequence above your genes that now are telling your genes what to do and telling your genes how to interpret the instructions in your DNA sequence of how it's going to, I mean, basically uh, execute your whole physiological being. We, and here's the thing, they know. Why do you think they constantly trigger us? There's negative consequences in trigger. Number one, when you're triggered, you don't think. When you're triggered, you're actually in a state of what's called implicit memory where literally all the events of trauma that 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 are behind you are literally coming up to the surface and you're relieving it so if you have a traumatic event and you get triggered now you're not thinking you're literally back in that trauma it's not a memory it's reliving it your body is literally reliving it every cell in your body literally records memory of traumatic experiences it also records memories of happy experiences, but but again, just like negative information, it, it, it's not as emphatic. You've got to literally detox and reprogram your entire genetic biological makeup in order to shift and become more healthy, shift and become more mentally prepared. This is why it's so important. This is why I fight so hard to do what I do in the world is because a lot of us have been programmed to destroy ourselves. Some of us expeditiously, and some of us are taking the short, I mean, the long, slow route, but we are shortening our lives. We're killing the quality of life that we could have. And it's because we are being fed information, false information about ourselves that makes us believe we are locked into a predetermined position of sub servitude, uh, substandard living, and that actually has an impact on us so we keep fighting and yearning to have what we believe we can't have and the truth of the matter is we're yearning for it 
but from the wrong position and from the wrong place. And then not until we determine in ourselves that we're going to make a shift will we ever have the true nature of what we need. We've got to discover ourselves. That's why I work so hard to build programs that socialize young boys and young girls, that revisit the possibilities for young men and young women, that really help couples rediscover the real, true, necessary and uh, uh, nature of marriage so that we restore families so that we build strong children. What did Frederick Dulles say? It's so much easier to build strong children than it is to repair broken men. We have work to do. Look, I could go on and on on this, but uh, I'm just gonna keep letting things inspire me uh, to talk and bring to you things in uh, as interesting of a way as possible. We've gotta also get out of the idea that we need to be entertained to learn. Some of the stuff that you're gonna have to take and get it's going to be methodical. It's going to be painstaking. It's not going to be things that make you laugh, make you dance, but it's going to be absolutely necessary for you to walk in power and for you to pass that power on to your progeny. I'm suggesting that you get out of that and start looking for the things that can feed you, the things that can elevate you, the things that can empower you, the things that can snatch you out of what Dr. Cleo Manigo calls the traumatic trance. We have work to do. Uh, I'm about to get off of here. If you like what you've heard, click the like button. Um, if you haven't subscribed, subscribe. Definitely share it. If you believe in the necessity of the work that I do in research, in program development, in direct engagement in the community, in working with families, and working with kids, and working with uh, young adults, look in the description box. Click the link and give. On that note, look, I'm out of here. Thank you guys for uh, spending time with me. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day. Yeah. Yeah. They said I should give it up like that just ain't good enough. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time you know outside of the businesses that i run like myriad business solutions the visionetics institute odyssey media group i also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in houston dallas and other areas uh, i'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the odyssey project is doing in the inner cities uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.